welcome back to the channel everybody i am mick alphany so we're going to begin here with a little bit of xrp news things are starting to heat up greatly so i might add but you know what else i see is a lot of pressure on the psychologies of people there's a there's a lot of frustration and i understand it uh people want to see things happen and they don't happen in the time span that you want them to happen and so there's a lot of frustration but i will say this that there is a lot of strength in controlling the mind, controlling the uh, controlling your your patience, your willpower. Nothing is going to be easy, especially if it's big, right? The greatest thing you can ever master is going to be yourself. Know thyself. Know thyself. Know yourself, and control yourself. Control your mind. When that mind starts getting out of control, and this is about life, not just crypto. When your mind starts getting out of control, you have to reel it back in, refocus, resettle yourself, calm down, breathe, <sighs> breathe, breathe, and maintain that control. Conquer yourself. If you can stay firm, stay steady, stay focused, not let the mind or the body throw you off, you can conquer great things. But it takes that discipline, that measure of discipline and anything that you want to do. You want to be great at business, you want to be great at art, you want to be great at any of these things that you can shine at, it's going to take great discipline. You're going to have to go further than everybody else. You're going to have to push further than everybody else. And that's the difference. That willpower to go forward, that's the difference between winners and losers. Those people who get the little money, the now money, and those people who have generational wealth, there's a difference. It's happened before already. This is not. This is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. This has all happened before. Now, granted, this may happen a little bit bigger this time. Whenever it happens, whatever it happens. But nonetheless, have knowledge. Strengthen yourself with it. Strengthen your heart and your mind. Whatever it is that you want to do, that you want to conquer, if this is it and you want generational wealth, if it is to come, that's up to you to decide. But if it is to come, it's only going to come to the strong. Focus, focus, focus. Not advice. You can do whatever you want. Let's begin right here on you dot today. Uh, I like that here. We used to do that in Taekwondo. It just lets the spiritual energy flow, the power flow. I don't know. I don't remember the reasoning behind it. I just remember it just makes me feel powerful. But anyway, we're going to start <laughs> start here on you dot today. This article is titled XRP price jumps 10. Uh, it's a 10%. It, it, uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's scroll down here. I hope everybody's having a good day. All right, I love every single one of you, whether you agree with me, disagree with me, you know, um, I understand love and hate is, is the same thing. It just differs in degree. They're part two opposite ends of the same pole. I accept it all. Now let's move on here. It says the price of XRP suddenly jumped 10% to outform, outperform the top 10 cryptocurrencies by market capitalization. XRP is outperforming Bitcoin and Ethereum in daily gains, as these are up to 0.62% and 2.8% respectively. You haven't seen anything yet. Nothing. Nothing. Wait until we get that decision from the judge. Just my humble opinion. Just wait. You're going to... All those people who left, they're still selling XRP right now. Just, people are leaving in droves, I'm telling you. Because they tell me. They're selling all their XLM, selling all their XRP, and that's what they're within their rights to do so. So be it. But what's going to happen if we get a positive uh, outcome to the case? You're going to see a massive flood of people back in XRP, the likes of which you've never seen. Regular individuals, citizens, denizens, businesses, small, medium. It's going to be a feeding frenzy, like the likes of which people have never seen. I'm not the one. I'm not the only one saying this. You've heard the head of SBI remit say this. You heard a whole head, of, a whole bunch of other heads of businesses say the same thing. They're on the side. You got Korea watching the XRP's case. South Korea. They're all waiting patiently to pounce on on-demand liquidity. I tell you what, that could definitely move the price. And when XRP goes up, historically XLM goes up as well. 
I mean, we'll see what happens here. Let's scroll down here, read a little bit more. All right. It says, at the time of writing, XRP was up 11% in the last 24 hours at 0 0.42, well, 42 cents. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know why I read it like that, but that was kind of cool, actually. 0 0.42. In the last few hours, XRP has gained over 8%. The sharp recovery coincides with XRP bottoming out on its Bitcoin chart. Okay, let's move on to another article here. That was on U.Today. This next one is, is, is as well. This one here is from U.Today and says, it's titled, XRPL Solvency Proof Unveiled at Paris Blockchain Week. Why this is important. Let's scroll down here and read this little tidbit here. So it says, a new mechanism, XRPL Solvency Proof, is set to advance a privacy solutions toolkit for all users of DeFi's in the XRP ledger ecosystem and those who leverage XRP in real world use cases. More privacy for XRP users, XRPL solvency proof wins hackathon in Paris. So we're winning things now also. Privacy mechanism for XRP ledger, XRPL solvency proof that basically unlocks zero knowledge functions for this blockchain. Became the winner of XRPL's hackathon at Paris Blockchain Week. We know everybody's there right now showing off and, uh, you know, trying to bring in business. They're doing a good job, by the way. And after all of the, these, um, like, Paris Blockchain Week type events, there's a lot of other events going on right now as well. They're, you know, all of these things typically happen all at the same time. Then after that, we're going to get a lot of information. Typically, that's how it goes, and I'm looking forward to it. It says, Jason Tigas, Tigas? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, sir. My apologies. It says developer advocate at Ripple Inc. congratulated the winning team on March the 20th. Let's scroll down here and see if they have a little bit more on this here. Technically, the new obfuscation instrument allows individuals to prove solvency without revealing their wallet details like addresses, transactional history, and so on. This is huge. Woo! Now that they explain it like that, oh, I like it. We're becoming a absolute beast in a good way i know beast has a negative connotation in the archaic way of using the, the word you know i have to be careful with the etymology of certain things and the energies that they carry but the new age <laughs> meaning the beast means it's powerful it's good it can't be stopped right so that's the way i'm using it using it all right a flexible and feature rich solvency proof mechanism can be integrated in various use cases it can cryptographically prove the amount of funds stored by this or that wallet without exposing any data to third parties. Yes, yes, yes. And let me tell you something. You and I have both seen that the uh, central banks have been having a problem lately with a lot of people calling them out on CBDCs because of the whole, uh, you know, uh, personal information and data access, things of that nature, right? This solves it. So we become even more delicious to the banks. We solve another problem for these people. I almost said a bad word there in describing the central banks. <laughs> is describing the central banks. I had to hold myself back. All right. So once again, we, come, we become a little bit better. We just keep winning. Just That's just my humble opinion. You don't have to agree. All right. I love you anyway. Don't worry about it. All right. Let's move on here. It's a good day. It's a good day, man. Things are happening. We're conquering the week. All right. So, we're going to overcome anything, don't, no matter what's going on today. Like, don't get me wrong, every day has its struggles. It doesn't matter. We conquer the struggles. We don't let that get to our mind. We stay focused on the light, and we go towards the light, metaphorically speaking. And that's what we're doing. Boom, we're getting to it. So, this tweet here is from Ripple, and it goes as such. Liquidity, usability, and regu regulatory clarity are, build, are the building blocks needed for real world asset tokenization to take off liquidity we have it usability no one's better than us right now no one's better than us regulatory clarity is all we need they just told you what we need that's it before when everything rockets off they just gave it to you this is ripple x vp of growth this is it he said for real world asset tokenization to take off do you understand that trillions Sorry, I'm a little excited. I'm Hopefully, I'm not <laughs> getting too loud in your ear. My apologies. But <laughs> this is exciting. That's it. There's one, just one little thing. Well, it's not little, but one thing standing in our way. 
and then we take off. He just, this is the literal words that this individual is using. Let me read it again. They're telling. Liquidity, usability. I'm going to give you the knife hand. Yep, that's right. Liquidity, usability, and regulatory clarity are the building blocks needed for real world tokenization to take off. What do you think that means? If we're moving trillions upon trillions of dollars tokenizing all, all things, that price was skyrocket. That, and that's, I mean, that's what I want. I'm here for the bank's money. I'm here for all that big money. This says Ripple X VP of Growth, Marcus Infanger, on stage at, at hashtag PBW2023 with at block. Okay, so once again, Ripple is making his presence felt, doing a good job. Keep doing a good job, Ripple, Volante, and everybody building on the XRPO. I want that money to come from everywhere. Uh, uh, let's continue to do a good job, people. So, one last article from Pew Dot today. I, I, they, they're doing a good job over there. Make sure you go check them out. They have, uh, I mean, man, this is their time. It says, Ripple becomes primary partner of this vital UK nonprofit details. I'm just going to read this tiny little tidbit here. Tiny little tidbit. Make sure you head over to U.Today. Check them out. They are doing a great job. Managing director for the UK and Europe, Sandy Young, one of our warriors, has spread the word on Twitter that Ripple Crypto Company has begun collaborating with UK's major charity nonprofit organization that helps children sick with cancer. Great Ormond Street Hospital Children's Charity, Gosh Charity. So I'm going to stop right there. Listen, I respect this. I appreciate it. You see, Algorand and Ripple have been doing the most. Where they're keeping it balanced. I respect balance. Where, the, yes, uh, uh, they're trying to push the technologies forward. They want to make big partnerships, but they haven't forgot about the people. And they've proven it. Because this is like the third or fourth thing that, that Ripple is doing to help the children. They helped, they did some things to help. Remember, it was, uh, I think it was Ripple and Algorand and some other people. I think it was like Steph Curry or something like that. They had uh, pitched in to build something for the children. It was in California. I think it was in Oakland or something like that. Then you had, uh, I mean, there's so much going on. And then they do this, right? You got Algorand also feeding millions of children in, in India. You have Ripple doing this. I respect that. I appreciate that, you know, um, there's nothing more I can say about that. I respect it and I appreciate it. And I hope they continue to do things like this, remain balanced and give back to the people, help the people be different than the legacy system. And the people will respect it and appreciate it and reciprocate. The people will not forget that you help them. Goes a long way. All right. So now, so this was a retweet from Flair and it's from Covalent HQ. It says on January uh, 9th, Flair Networks airdrop. 4.3 billion Flare to his community. Our data shows the total addresses using Flare rose to 145K after Flare was distributed, as seen on March 17th. From just core infra to 145,000 addresses in two months, Flare has had a very healthy growth as a new chain. So there you have it. Flair, they're, they're saying that Flair is looking healthy. A lot of people uh, have an interest in Flair. I do believe that they're an interesting uh, project. I'm keeping my eye on them. Uh, you know, they're an interoperability. This is what this is from what I know, right? They're interoperability uh, protocol. So I, I want to see if they can reach quant levels. Then when they start bringing in partnerships like how quant is doing, then it'll really get interesting for me. But I'm just keeping an eye on them until now. But as of now, Quant is a, the interoperability, the, the, the king at the top when it comes to interoperability and gateless, uh, gateless, uh, no, not gateless, sorry about that, bridgeless systems. My apologies. So, yeah, so uh, I'm keeping my, my eye on Flare. So now let's go here. This is from coinedition.com and uh, it's titled Mixed Reactions Over Bets of Bitcoin Hitting $1 Million. And XRP reaching five hundred and eighty nine dollars. You know they, <laughs> you know they had to throw that number out there. Listen, if it reached that, I take it. No, no problem. Uh, but let's read about what's going on here. It says a group of Bitcoin maxis agreed to to a bet that Bitcoin would hit one million dollars. I thought it was one person. I read a bevy of articles about this. I thought it was one person that made that bet. It was between like two two people. But I guess they're saying it's a group now. Not sure if that's accurate or not. Sorry about that. I got a little hair, a little uh, air, air in my chest. Um, 
says, and another set, the XRP army. But why? I don't understand why they will come out at the same time that Bitcoin, they're making bets. The XRP army argued, which part of the XRP army? You just said the XRP army. Not everybody. You know, if it hit 589, that's cool. Good. Great. But it's not the whole art, the whole XRP army saying, hey, it's going to do this. No. But I love how they write it as though everyone is saying this. The XRP army argued that XRP has a chance of hitting $589. While both predictions appear credible, or appear incredible, David Gostein, the founder of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that company's name, so I'm just going to leave it out, highlighted that the crypto community seems partial in its reaction to both projections. According to Gostein, there was positive excitement when someone gambled that Bitcoin would hit $1 million within the next three months, which is mind-blowing. Even, even if hyperinflation does come and people retreat, I think a lot of people would retreat more to gold than to Bitcoin. I could be wrong about that. Um, of course, gold is a little bit safer. You won't get your money taken like that, like you would in Bitcoin. Um, however, you know, there's no slight to Bitcoin. I'm just, that's just my humble opinion. However, uh, yeah, even with hyperinflation and a retreat to Bitcoin, gold, and silver, Bitcoin hitting a million? Man. But it says, however, unlike the reaction to Bitcoin predictions, Gokstein noted that the crypto community dismissed the possibility of XRP ever reaching 589. Yeah, but I don't blame them, honestly. They don't really understand all the, and I'm not saying Bitcoin, I'm not saying XRP is going to hit 589, but I'm saying that most of the people that speak on XRP, they have not done their research. They don't understand all of the different bank partnerships, moving uh, uh, moving interbank payments, how much an interbank payment is, um, you know, the possibility of going from hundreds of banks using on-demand liquidity, RippleNet, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. I think they're going to use everything. Uh, to be quite honest, why would they just use one offering? When we get into deep enough business and prove ourselves with them, they would use a, 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 a myriad of, of offerings on the XRPL, in my humble opinion. And yeah, so, you know, XRP's price, really nobody knows where it's going to go. Sky's the limit, in my humble opinion, depending on what they issue on the chain, what they put across there, especially with the tokenization of everything. I mean, man, uh, it has great potential, right? You don't need to really put a solid number to it. Just know it's going to be good. It's just in my humble opinion. So he says, uh, so yeah, I guess he's questioning why there's such negativity towards XRP. So now this article here is from encryptonomist.ch and it's titled Stablecoin USDC after Silicon Valley Bank. So it says USDC stablecoins request to the Fed to survive the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. I don't think it's to survive, but it's to ensure let me read this a little tidbit and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Obviously, this has a big uh, a big connection with Stellar, who is pushing USDC everywhere. USDC basically is just a light version of a CBDC. That's really all it is. And uh, so it says here, Circle's request to have its USDC stablecoin backed by the Federal Reserve stems from the belief that such backing would provide greater stability and security for the company and its customers. Yeah, but... but this is very, very suspicious in my humble opinion. If they're backed by the Fed, right? They're, they're, they're keeping their money at the Fed and such, and they they have to be regulated by the Fed in order to do that, that provides regulatory clarity, doesn't it? That would provide regulatory clarity for USDC, which then in a way kind of provides US, uh, regulatory clarity for Stellar in a way because they, would, they are the biggest pusher of USDC everywhere, especially with MoneyGram and having corridors all around the world. But then if you have regulatory clarity and you have, you're holding your reserves at the Fed and the Fed is kind of in charge of regu regulating you, right? Doesn't that sort of make you a CBDC? I don't, I don't know. You guys tell me. This is getting interesting very quickly. Now, I could be wrong on all of this. And I would like to hear if people disagree. But it seems like they're trying to be really sneaky and become a CBDC. That's what it sounds like to me. And don't get me wrong, they're justified in, in not wanting to trust another bank. They're justified in that, but they could have gone to any of the bigger banks, right? They're going to directly to the Fed. That's key. All the while, Stellar is just sitting back salivating over the fact that now they have the UN, the United Nations in their back pocket. They have um, 
the CFTC in their back pocket. If this happens, listen, if you're going to regulate USDC and you're holding the funds that back USDC and you have Stellar pushing USDC everywhere, that's a Stellar Fed connection in my humble opinion. It's a light one. It's a light one. But that's a Stellar Fed connection. I mean, I don't. you guys let me know. It says here, currently the USDC stablecoin is backed by a reserve of U.S. dollars held by Circle and his partners, which Circle believes is vulnerable to market fluctuations and other risks. In contrast, Circle believes that backing USDC stablecoin with U.S. dollars held at the Federal Reserve would provide a level of security not currently available. Now, another interesting thing, I remember there was a politician, I don't remember which one, who suggested that um, USDC, no, no, it wasn't a politician. I think it was somebody from the Fed. Don't quote me on this, but I just recall, and some of you may also, when they, remember they were saying like, we may not need to issue a CBDC. Remember they were saying that for a long time? And then they were like, well, we could pro possibly just you utilize stable coins like a CBDC. Banks could utilize stable coins. Remember they were saying that? But one of the stable coins they put out front was USDC. They, at that time, they really liked USDC. They didn't like Tether, right? No slight to Tether. I don't have a problem with either one of these stable coins, to be quite honest. I'm just putting it out there what they were saying at the time to lay the foundation of my thoughts. But I don't know, man. I'm, I'm watching USDC very closely. If USDC was ever utilized by the Fed or anybody like a light version of a CBDC or a, like they combined because they said they wanted to control the amount of CBDC that was out there. This is what most of the central banks were saying. But if they're going to control how much of the uh, of their CBDC is out there, right? And they need a little bit more digital assets to play with, they could use that in combination with USDC. Right? They can use USDC like a like a state like a uh, like a, a, a central bank digital currency. But if they do that, here's what I'm getting to. If they do that, and you have a ton of flow of USDC. And Stellar is one of the biggest pushers of CBDC. And you have a ton. This is just a what if scenario. And you have a ton of value flowing across Stellar at any point because of this. What does it do to that price of XLM? Every account must have a modicum of XLM. Surge pricing is triggered when the Stellar, uh, uh, when the Stellar chain is congested. What is it due to the price of XLM? You tell me. Not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. That's just my humble opinion. Doesn't matter to me whether you sell Stellar, buy Stellar. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter my humble opinion. I'm waiting on that bank money. And uh, let's move on here. Because then we have a little bit more Stellar related news. This is a tweet from Bit, Bit Global, right? It says here, at BIS Org Innovation Summit 2023, Started with a bang. Christine Lagarde's comments on CBDC and privacy were very uh, were very balanced and timely. Lagarde reminded us that central banks are not in the business of storing or tracking individual consumer information or transactions. Isn't that interesting? How all of this is coinciding, all happening at the same time. You have Ripple and the, the XRPL, not Ripple. Sorry about that. The XRPL just had this project that negates information and all of the, those types of things that, you know. Then you have them saying this at the BIS, you have Bit retweeting it. Let's go, let's scroll down, see what they say. Bit says this, this is the responsibility of consumers, financial institutions for KYC, KYC slash AML purposes. Bit values customers' right to privacy. We built our digital currency management system, DCMS, which is what they were combining with the Stellar blockchain to do some of their CBDCs for projects and I believe for the Ukraine as well. It says, we built our digital currency management system without the need to access personal identifiable information, which means what? Well, my interpretation of that, what I grabbed from that immediately is, hey, come build on us, use us for CBDCs because we can assure the, the public that we have nothing to do with taking their data. Our system is not built to extract their data and we, we protect their privacy, in fact. So if you build a CBDC with us, then you don't have to worry about that. That's what BIT is trying to say. And that's a great thing um, because they've been talking to a bevy of central banks, commercial banks, 
um, you know that they're very close with the, the Bank of International Settlements because they, they uh, place very high in one of their contests. Then BIT has a lot of power in, in, uh, in South America because if you remember, BIT and Stellar, I believe it was, that went for the CBDC. They tried to win that contest to become the CBDC for uh, Brazil. They didn't wind up winning that, but they, make a he they made a heck of an impact because they ranked very high. So this is very important when they're talking to central banks who are having this big backlash. It's a huge backlash right now about information and data when it comes to CBDCs. Most of the world doesn't like the idea of CBDCs. I say this, if you don't like the idea of CBDCs, Use the bank coins outright. You don't have to worry about anybody's taking your information, your data, such like that. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So now let's move on here. Oh, V chain, V chain, mighty, mighty V chain. Oh man, I love to see big things happening with V chain. So they they retweeted this here. It was from DigiCard Key Services. It says this: DigiCard, which is built obviously built on V chain. DigiCard Key offers banks. Yes. Piche, go after the banks. Come on, come on in. Become a bank coin. Do it. Let's let's get some trillions. <laughs> let's get some trillions over to you. All right. DigiCard Key offers banks, consignment services, and vault provide all the big monies. Oh, muy linda, mi gente. And vault providers. Third-party scanning programs assuring owners their items are still safe in the vault. Demand. It says, De ooh, demand. You're a little aggressive. <laughs> You're a little aggressive, aren't you, DigiCard? Demand DigiCard key powered by VeChain. Then they give you a little example here. <laughs> Shots fired at J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan Chase thought it had $1.3 million worth of nickel stored in the warehouse. I guess they didn't. That, like, wow, that is so concerning. Is it, it was, they stored it in bags. What? They stored it in bags in a Dutch warehouse. What? Like this, that's the best you can do with all that value? The people trust these people who store value in a bag in a warehouse. Not in a, listen, I, listen. Not in a vault. You didn't want to put that in a vault. You could build then build the infrastructure for the vaults that that can provide space for that. I'm gonna tell you what right now. You're not gonna be keeping any value of mine in any bag. Wow, that's uh, mind blowing. Yeah, they need V Chain. That's all I can say about that. But yes, V Chain, go after those banks. Um, they're a great project. They're one of our pure utility coins. If you remember back in the ch beginning of the channel, we used to talk a lot about it. We talk about it every once in a while now, but they're still doing a great job. VeChain was one of our pure utility coins. That's a non-bank coin. VeChain, Polygon, Batcoin, GRT, and a few others. We, I don't really talk about Zillica anymore because that had popped at the time. You know, uh, took profit off of that one there. So, uh, but yeah. So I love to see VeChain do good. So now, let's move on here because this is big. Quant continues to talk big money. That's what I want to hear. Talk big money right here. Right here. Tell me right here. <laughs> All right. It says here, the next generation's family silver tokenizing non-bankable assets by Andrew Carrier. This is on quant.network. And quant, I can't, I can't wait for the next bull run. Quant is going to surprise people. It's so interesting to me. It's like quant will explode when, at times when nothing else is ex exploding. Nothing else is increasing in price. Quant will explode. Everybody will be talking about quant. And then after that, every, all the people take profit. I'm hanging in there because I see where quant can go. But uh, after that, the people just forget about quant. And it's almost not talked about ever again. It's unbelievable. I, I don't know. But I, all I know is quant, 2K, 5K is easy. But first, let's get past the, the former all-time high. Everything in degrees. But I do like to have a little fun. That's why I talk about Listen, and, and 2K, 5K is nothing for Quant if they if they actually um, just actuate what they're supposed to be used for. All those banks, actuate those partnerships. Let's get those going at some point, and then boom, Quant explodes easily. So I have a lot of fun talking about that. Let's read this little tidbit here because they're going to talk some big money to you right now. So technology now enables non-bankable assets to be tokenized and included as part of people's professionally managed portfolios. 
those wealth management firms that are quick to adapt will have a significant competitive advantage. When we think of high net worth families and their assets from professional wealth management perspective, we often think of cash, stocks, and other easily quantifiable investments. However, a significant portion of ultra high wealth net worth, uh, net worth wealth is tied up in assets that are harder to manage and quantify. Things like real estate, vintage cars, art, wine, jewelry, and other passion interests. Accenture estimates that nearly, here's the money people, here's the money, ne estimates that nearly half of the world's ultra high net worth wealth is held in these non-bankable assets, equating to around 30 trillion globally. Talk that money to me. I don't mean to talk that money to me. $30 trillion. <sighs> Which shows that Quant is focused on that money. First, they focused on the banks. Now they're focused on these types of assets here, moving at the tokenizing them and moving them across Quant. Imagine just a modicum, a tiny little piece of that trillions. With a little piece of that 30 trillions moving across Quant. What does it do to that price? Be honest now. What does it do to that price of quant? 30 trillion, this is what they're focused on. And you know quant means business. Meanwhile, quant is setting up infrastructures in the UAE, in Latin America. Listen, there's serious business here. It says, as the world, finance, the world of finance continues to evolve and technology advances, the question arises, can these non-bankable assets be tokenized? You know they can. You know it. We're all, well, you know it, you know it can. So let's keep going, let's keep reading. It says, um, and include it as part of people's professionally managed portfolios. Ooh, I like how they're talking, yes. Put them in play, so that way at any time, but see, it's a double-edged sword. I want that to be tokenized, because that's gonna make that price of quant explode if we're moving that value, if we're holding that value, storing that value. Heck, there can be staking involved with that. Like, oh, you hold that value on our chain, you get some, some rewards, something like that. So yeah, that's a lot of incentive. But at the same time, I feel bad for the people who may have family heirlooms that value is stored, stored in, you know, handed down to them. Now you can actually make bring liquidity to that value they're going to be staring at that value, a lot of people, and say, hmm, I could probably sell this. And so now you have these legacy items, these heirlooms, just being traded like they were nothing, you know? Um, that's a little bit a little bit sad to think about, in my humble opinion. It, but anyway, so once again, they say increase liquidity. This is what they will get if they do these particular things, increase liquidity. Tokenization allows for fractional ownership of an asset. Like I said, they'll be selling these things where they were just holding them before and protecting their value, they will be selling them. Um, just, the way, the, just the way of the world now. Uh, everything gets sold. So, which means investors can purchase a portion of an asset rather than buying it outright. Lower transaction costs. Increased transparency. Across, uh, access to a broader pool of investors. True. Fractional ownership. That's if you wanted that. Like Once, I, once again, see what I was talking about before. You know, a lot of these things are are, are, are are generational wealth type items where that that wealth was stored in these things just to hold there to protect them, and now they will be able to be liquidated with ease. You know, which would make the price of quant explode. But man, oh man, the world is changing rapidly. Let's move to another article here. All right, we have about six left. Let's see if we can get through just a few of them. Just a few. So this here is from cryptonomus.ch, E-N, cryptonomus.ch, and it's about Hedera, all right? And it says here, the public ledger Hedera, H-bar. Hedera is a popular crypto platform within the industry. It's popular, like people barely talk about Hedera. I think it's just a few of us that really talk about H-bar and understand the power of H-bar, you know, um, I understood that this H bar was one of the first crypto I ever learned about. I remember, I think I was looking, it was either on Binance US or it was on um, Uphold on one of them. And I was looking through all the coins. I've told this story before. And I was like, what the heck is H bar? Then they, they, they kept on reiterating on whatever article I was reading that H bar is not 
blockchain. I'm like, well, it's not blockchain. What the heck is it? Oh, it's something called Hashgraph. Then I went to their website and I'm reading about Hashgraph. I'm reading their white papers. I'm like, whoa, look at this power. Uh, and then I saw, it was after that, then I saw their governing council. I said, well, this is a major project. Let's continue on right here. But popular, I would disagree with that. It's not popular just yet, but I hope it gets there one day. It says, it has earned a reputation within the crypto community for operating as an ideal crypto platform for the decentralized economy because it's super decentralized. Uh, it provides an ideal framework for individuals and businesses to create powerful decentralized applications, dApps. Aside from this, the Hedera platform also provides feasible solutions to several blockchain platforms, platform limitations within the cryptocurrency industry, such as slow performance, slow speeds, high transaction costs, and instability. Its proof of stake consensus mechanism increases the efficiency of, of transaction verification on the network and provides a high level of security. Was it, was it Hedera that said they have, I think Hedera, it was Hedera said they have military grade security. I think that's it was Hedera. Uh, and then XDC had another level of security. They described it. They described it in a different way, but they both have like the top, top of the top security. It's the best way I could put it. Not quite eloquent, but that's the best way that I could put it. It says, increases the efficiency of transaction verification on the network and provides high level of security, thereby protecting the network from hacker attacks. Its native cryptocurrency HBAR plays an integral part, which means it's going to be used a lot when everything is up and running, new financial system, integral part within this ecosystem by providing value and facilitating all crypto operations, including network governance, user interaction, and payment fees. The HBAR token is available on Binance, all that, that we don't need to go into. So yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to see an article on a big website being written uh, about, partially, about HBAR. So now let's move on here. And, and, and that's another reason why everything, everything that they stated is another reason why HBAR is so delicious to the banks. So now I have three more articles, but I want to close this video out. I don't want to make it too long or this video will be an hour. I have so many articles, um, but I'm happy to, to be doing good research and, and digging some things up here. Um, sometimes it's tough and information is very dry. So let's close out with some Hong Kong some Hong Kong information because we've been uh, Hong Kong. Sorry about that. Uh, we've been talking about it quite a bit. This is from CoinEdition.com. It says Hong Kong sees overwhelming response to uh, crypto policy. All right. Uh, by the way, to anybody out there, Dajahao, or if you speak Cantonese, Neho. Uh, let's continue right here. It says Hong Kong's uh, Hong Kong's recent shift in its crypto policy seems to have grabbed the attention of virtual asset service providers and businesses from around the world. Island uh, City Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury recently highlighted the overwhelming response. So, United Arab Emirates trying to become a hub of crypto, UK wants to be a hub of crypto, and then you have Hong Kong. And I'm telling you right now, Hong Kong is gonna move at a lightning pace. They know exactly what to do and they have capital to move around to make it happen. All right, but let's continue right here. It says, according to a report by Bloomberg, Christopher Wee, uh, the Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, revealed that more than 80 institutions and entities, 80, had expressed interest in expanding their presence in the island city of Hong Kong. Quote, Hong Kong is one of the pioneers in the world in terms of having a holistic regulatory regime for virtual assets more broadly rather than crypto per se. Secretary Wee stated in a Bloomberg television interview with Yvonne Mann and David Ingalls. He highlighted the investor protection and financial stability aspects of the updated crypto policy. Secretary Wee recently addressed a speech at the Aspen Digital Web 3 Investment Summit, where he pointed out the efforts made by the government of Hong Kong to position the city as a leading hub for crypto and Web 3 initiatives in Asia. Well, let me tell you, they definitely can do that. They definitely can. They're very powerful over there. They have good minds, good minds that work over there. However, the UAE is out front. They then they have they have quite the lead on everyone else. Everyone else. So there's going to be a little bit of competition there. Uh, but now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, let's get to the money.